Hey everybody, I'm Buck of Chris's. This is Plural Activism and Selves Advocacy. We Chris's, and especially me, Buck, are going to be talking a lot during this conference about empowerment. This session is specifically to bridge internal empowerment with external empowerment and describe empowerment as we see it as a group and especially how I see it as an individual within the group. I started out as an internal persecutor. I not only would defend our group against external emotional manipulation and accusations from our parents and from others, I also started turning that into internal dialogue and started putting down people inside of the system. I didn't know I was doing it, but that's how my PTSD manifested when I was young. Not when the body was young, but when I was young. So I spent many years talking smack, putting people down, questioning what they were saying, denying their truths, taking their power away in any way I could, usually verbal manipulation. I would try to cut people down to size. I'd talk back to them, tell them what they were thinking was wrong. It was just reflexive. It wasn't done on purpose. Or it was done on purpose, but I really didn't know who I was doing it to. I didn't know I was doing it to my buddies. How does that manifest itself now? I went from being a four-year-old, really stubborn kid who was really angry and hurt to being like a 14-year-old teenager constantly pushing back against anything. I'd push back against the internal community. I'd push back against the external community. It didn't matter to me. It just felt like everything was oppressing me, that I had to be defensive about everything. I didn't even realize when I did it, but I aged up. Something clicked inside. Some kind of self-work got to me, or it was just time to be done with being so defensive. While I was a teenager, I was kind of teetering on the edge of being able to see the here and now, but still being broody and resistant. So it was still, I guess, in our terms, I'd say I was a passenger, but I was still having problems. And then I decided to stop having problems, I guess, on some level. It was subconscious. It wasn't something I did consciously, but I decided to join in. It was kind of the, if you can't beat them, join them. It's like, why am I beating on these people? (laughs) Why, Why am I so negative? Why am I doing this to the people who really care about me and are trying to protect me and help me? I became fully co conscious and joined the crew of the ship. And now one of my pet peeves, I guess, is disempowerment. And I see it everywhere. I see a lot of plural systems disempowering the people within their system. I see it happening between the so-called in-crowd versus the harder folk to onboard in their system. So from the the co-conscious group, I see them disempowering those who are less easy to like, I guess. So I work really hard on the self-help materials that have to do with dealing with those rebels, as I call them. So I'm also writing United Front Rebels or rewriting it because it needs to really be for the rebels and not for the co-conscious group. So I'm rewriting it from my point of view, talking to the rebels. And so that's a big work in progress for our group. And I'll be doing a couple of sessions here at the conference as well. This session is about empowerment. It's about empowerment inside of your system and empowerment outside of your system. And so I'm bringing my voice to this because this is really my thing. Now that I'm co-conscious, now that I'm front, now that I've got a strong voice within our system and in our external world, in our dealings with outside, I'm completely (laughs) gung-ho about this issue. It's really mine. I'm very passionate and driven about this. So it also drives me nuts when the outside world is oppressing people. I am definitely an activist. I'm a civil rights activist and a plural activist. So what does empowerment mean? Empowerment means having freedom. I'm not talking about freedom to do whatever you want. There's still laws, but having the freedom within those laws to determine what you do. Having representation on the things that matter to you. Like if our government worked the way it was supposed to, we'd actually have representation for the things that we want, having voted them into office rather than special interests bribing them to do other things. So if we had accurate representation, that's empowerment. If we have an active voice, if we are able to speak up 
and speak out and be heard. Having power and control, so not being disempowered or being out of control, but actually being able to determine our own destiny and to hold the reins with our choices and to bring our life to where we want it to go, that's power and control. Choices. Sometimes people are disempowered by taking their choices away, limiting choices or directing them to certain choices. So being given choice, being educated about those choices is very important for empowerment. Another part of empowerment is being recognized, being seen, being listened to. So not being squelched, not being pushed away, not being denied of personhood, not being denied of being recognized as a valid person or a valid opinion. Getting equal care is another way of being empowered. And getting equal rights, so equality, basically, is part of being empowered. One of the things we, we practice as the Chris's is something called radical inclusion. Just a little bit about this. We almost could make this into a whole session or a podcast. Radical inclusion to us is when you recognize people who are different and you include them anyway. You don't say, oh, you don't have this enough. You, you aren't this. You can't be here. You, you exclude people who are being abusive or trolling and stuff, but you don't exclude people just based on demographics. You don't exclude people based on them being different than you. Different is still valid. Different is still an, an accurate voice from their perspective. It's still valuable. It's still equal. So radical inclusion is including anybody who wants to be under the umbrella or wants to be in the group, so long as they're not violating anybody's space or the rules of the group. For example, in the queer 60s, you had different groups. You had lesbians and you had gays and you had trans, for example, and then you had all the people who didn't fit in those groups kind of scattered around. And then after Stonewall, there was a lot more inclusion. People realized that to be stronger and to fight back, they needed more people under the queer umbrella, under the LGBTQIA plus umbrella. They needed more inclusivity. So they started getting together, whether they meant to or not, whether by design or choice or accident, they started getting together. So shortly after Stonewall was also the death of Judy Garland and the march to Washington Square in New York City. So both of these events took place in New York City. The birth of pride, of queer pride, was this this back-to-back, I want to say tragedy, but activism, this back-to-back emotional outcry, this emotional climate that brought together so much of these different littler queer communities under a bigger umbrella so they could act as one. They didn't act as one all the time. They had plenty of infighting and disagreements within the different groups. But when it came to fighting back against injustice, they came together under an umbrella and worked together towards the goal of equality and towards the goal of destigmatizing and towards the goal of fairness and representation and having a voice and power and control and choices and recognition. They all banded together under the larger umbrella to fight back against society that was continually oppressing them and taking those things away. So in order to get something done, in order to relieve pressure. Sometimes you have to get together with people you may not always agree with. This is radical inclusivity, is to find your common ground and in spite of it, have a conversation, in spite of the differences, have a conversation and find where the overlaps are and what you can agree on and what needs to be fought for that you can fight for together. And that may mean some groups say, look, that's not our issue, but we're going to fight for your rights We're going to help you. And this is our issue. And can you help us? So you have, for example, back to the lesbian and gay queer pride umbrella. So you have lesbians and gays helping trans people get rights. And you have trans people helping lesbian and gays get rights, even if they're not their own rights and their own issues. 
there's plenty of crossover between those groups as well. So that also helps. We have that in the plural community. We have this bigger umbrella, which we call being plural, and it can change its name, but it's still going to be there. Being multiple, being plural, having many people in your head, the experience of being many, that is going to continue to be there, whether people like it or not. So whatever we call the umbrella is going to be there. This experience of being many includes many other experiences under the umbrella, which all are stigmatized simply because of being many. That is in itself is a stigma. One of the challenges is going to be talking about this and, and helping people realize that this larger umbrella exists and this larger umbrella is valid, that it needs representation, it needs a voice, it needs its own power and control as a group. We need our power and control. And there's a history of people underneath this umbrella being oppressed simply for the fact of being plural. Within that, there are the people who have gotten a diagnosis, whether it's DID or OSDD or any related diagnoses, may include some people with schizophrenia who may or may not be misdiagnosed or may include themselves under the plural umbrella. And it can include voice hearers, it can include tulpamancers, endogenics. We are all at a disadvantage in society simply through the fact of being plural, simply by being many. We can also leverage the strength of the plural community as a whole to fight against those who are oppressing people with DID or the stigma of DID. So we can all band together and agree, hopefully, that there is oppression going on and all work towards another end. Let me take you through this whole spectrum of working on the internal empowerment all the way through this external empowerment that I just described that we would all hopefully share and be radically inclusive so that we include more people under this umbrella to help fight for everybody's rights. So one of the things that informs this whole lecture for us is our activism as a group, the Chris's. We've been on the board of independent living in Newburgh, New York, and this year we're chair of the board. We've been on the board for nine full years, and we can't help but be informed by the independent living movement and the independent living philosophy. We're not here to represent Independent Living Inc. in Newburgh, New York. We believe in the philosophy very deeply, the independent living movement itself as a whole. So let me explain what I understand, what we understand of the movement and the philosophy so that you have some idea of what our goal is in bringing you this whole talk. Accessibility is the removal of the infrastructure and the institutional and attitudinal barriers to people having access to things. The infrastructure it would be how public transportation works. It would be anything in the infrastructure, how the roads work, how cars work, all of these things that have been built around the idea that people have two arms and two legs, eyes that can see, ears that can hear. There are people who do fit that and don't have barriers to their accessing these things and the assumptions that are made by society. There are other people that do have barriers to accessing these things. It's because of the assumptions that are made that there is, quote unquote, disability. This is the social model of disability. It's saying, basically, if people design, and, I, and we're a former graphic designer, so we like this idea of design, right? If people design access, if they design without barriers, that there will be people who won't be disabled by these structures, by these things that are put into place. The institutional barriers, maybe the culture, it may be the rules and the laws that are put in place, the guidelines and so on that already have inherently built into them limitations. Like who decided there should be this much red tape and can somebody who has a developmental disability access it with all of that red tape involved? Can an autistic person access that given their neurodivergence? Can they access it the same way somebody else can? 
are they going to need assistance because of it? So why don't we remove the extra red tape and make these processes easier for everybody rather than making them so difficult that it requires assistance to get through it? So it's this idea of removing those barriers and the attitudinal barriers. Why does a cop pull their gun on a mental health case? Why are these attitudes out there in, in say, Hollywood that it's okay to take a mental illness and make that the cornerstone of why somebody is a villain? Why are these okay? Why are there these attitudinal issues? Another cornerstone of the independent living movement is this idea of nothing about us without us. Having fair representation in everything that affects people with differences, disabilities, with neurodivergence, and so on. We should have fair representation. There shouldn't be a company, a nonprofit about us that doesn't have us on the board. There shouldn't be a professional industry that stops people who have our mental health issues from being a member. So the independent living movement is a worldwide movement that demands the opportunities, the inclusion, the self-determination, self-respect that we deserve. And the independent living philosophy is that people with disabilities are the best experts in their own needs and that we can take initiative and individually or collectively design and promote better solutions and that we can also organize for political power to fight back against those institutions and infrastructure and attitudes that are our barriers to access. To put it into a little bit more lay terms, the main message of the independent living movement is we are not sick, we're not weak, we're not defective, we're not deviant, we're not objects to be pushed aside, we need assistance and not intervention, we aren't a burden, and we need society to remove those barriers so that we can re raise our families, go to school, get jobs, basically participate fully in all of the things that others can do to enjoy life. And in doing that, the independent living movement stands for demedicalization of disability, deinstitutionalization, uh, such as nursing homes, and cross disability advocacy. So the independent living movement is not for any particular disability, it's for all disabilities. That's mental health, neurodivergence physical health issues, mobility issues, sensory issues, substance abuse issues, homelessness, poverty, all these social disadvantages that disable people. And I'm sure I left out a few. So bringing those ideas into the internal system, when we're making a co-conscious group, when we're making our crew for our spaceship, if you will, we choose to lower these barriers. We choose to work on stigma within our system. This is how the Chris's work. We don't stigmatize people who don't agree with us in our system. We don't jail them for disagreeing. We think everybody owns this life together, that this is a group project, and that everybody in here deserves access, representation, voice, freedom, Choices, recognition, equal care, equal rights, freedom, and fair representation. And I don't know if I said that twice, but that's okay. They all deserve power and control. Within that, we do have our limits. We do have rules, but we invite everybody to the meeting and we all make the rules together. So somebody becomes a passenger on our vessel, or even when they're a stowaway, they're still invited to the meeting. We've had people come straight from being stowaways straight into a meeting. And that's how they became a passenger or a crew member is because they showed up. So we hold open door meetings and invite everybody on the ship every time we have a meeting. It's called an all hands meeting. It's like basically everybody who can shows up. And this is how we empower each other. We sit down at our meeting. We go over our internal rules and we ask if anybody needs a change made to the rules. We do our best to accept everybody's needs. So it's not, oh, I disagree with that. We're not doing that. It's, oh, okay, can we talk more about why you need that? Can we figure out what the, the base problem is? Can we get rid of the actual problem instead of the symptom? 
like what's the real deeper issue? Can we resolve that issue? Can we can we do something that will make you feel more comfortable? So it's not always like I want ice cream every Tuesday and then we just say, okay, ice cream every Tuesday. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, why do you feel the need for that? And what will that do to us as a whole? And can you understand that we have a problem with sugar and we're having trouble finding acceptable ice cream that we all like? you know, enough the the ingredients list that we're willing to subject our body to that. So can we find something that's going to work for you that may not be harmful for all of us? So we work on rules and regulations and we try and whittle it down to everybody being happy and able to agree. And that means there's some compromises. It means there's some win-win situations And it does mean that occasionally we have some very difficult decisions to make about conflicting needs. But the goal is always to empower everyone. Moving from the internal world towards the external world, once we're all empowered or we're working on empowerment within the system, we can start moving some of that empowerment into the external world. Having that solid base inside helps us to work on all of these various issues outside. So empowerment within the system is extremely important. It's like a foundation or a nest. It's our playground. It's like where we experiment with things that we want to bring to the external world. But it's also where we can always return back for safety. So when things outside aren't going very well, we can come back inside and we can get recharged and taken care of by our buddies. So we consider that to be kind of like the nest from which the bird flies and then comes back, the roost where that bird lives and then takes off, goes around, flies, does its thing, and then comes back home to rest. So having our internal world be stable and be a place where we all feel empowered is very important for us, Chris's, and we advocate for others to try this too. The next step when we're moving this into the external world, if we have a therapist, is to start working on moving our relationship with our therapist from being a patient relationship to being a client relationship. And we're going to advocate for this on the therapist end as well. The idea is you should own your power in therapy. And if you're not working with a therapist, that's fine. If you're, we just recorded our bootstrapping presentation. If you're doing that, that's already internally empowering in many ways. But working with somebody who's constantly thinking down about you and taking your power away and controlling your life, telling you what to do and what to work on next is very disempowering. And that relationship needs to be in a secure place where you have the reins. You're working on such important, deep stuff. It very much affects your internal world. So you you really need to control that. You need to own that environment as much as possible, which means within whatever rules you and your therapist work out for the relationship, which should be mutually beneficial, the therapist may only have one time slot for you, but if the therapist doesn't, maybe they give you the choice of which time slots to pick. The therapist may have ideas of what traumas you would work on first, but really you should have the final say and say, no, that's too deep, that's too raw, I can't work on that, I'm ready to work on this one. Let's work on this one. So there are parts of the therapeutic relationship you should really hold the steering wheel and be in charge of. And there are things within therapy that the therapist will have to have the brake control and the dual control vehicle of the therapy relationship. And we'll have to be able to say, no, we're not going there and step on the brake. It's very important for the client to be empowered and for it to be a more equal relationship, possibly even an unequal relationship where the therapist is a consultant and the client has final say. Just like any other client in any project that somebody's getting paid to do, you're the client, you hold the money. The next thing we consider kind of in this spectrum of empowerment is selves determination. It's the free choice of doing your own actions without external compulsion. So bringing this into your external life more. The next step we consider after you've worked on some internal community work and you're internalized your empowerment, 
and you've worked on things in therapy so that you have more control over the therapeutic process, which really affects your internal world so closely, is self determination within your system, working on the choice of having freedom within yourselves to have your own traditions, your own culture, your own ideas of what's going on in your head, to choose where your community is going, to look back and consider what historical ties and heritage you want to bring into your future together, your own internal language and religion, your sense of self and identity and kinship within your system, the will to constitute a people as in a community or group or nation. You all have some things in common. So self-determination is usually all of these things for a external group of people. And I'll talk about it again when it comes to plurality. But the self-determination inside, you all have shared and common enemies who have hurt you in the past. You all have common suffering of the PTSD and the CPTSD from the things that happened. So that's kind of part of the heritage and why you need self-determination. That suffering can rob you of your power. You don't want to over-identify with it, but you also don't want to let it go. So it can become part of the culture and the heritage, but you don't want it to be a ball and chain that holds you back either. So the next thing is the nothing about us without us also goes for your treatment plan from your therapist. Okay, here's the three steps, and this is what we're going to do, and it's going to end with unification, or it's going to end with healthy multiplicity. They're a consultant. It's not their job to tell you where you want to go. It's their job to help you get there. It's your job to say, this is where I want to go. Be included in creating your own recovery plan. It's called a recovery plan in the recovery movement. It's not a treatment plan, which is very disempowering and comes down from the licensed expert to the quote unquote patient. A recovery plan, which is something that you co create with your therapist. The therapist lays out ideas and options. You ask questions, you get more informed, they help you make decisions. If you're not in a place where you can make those decisions yet, then you're right back to basically stabilization and other work that doesn't require having an end plan yet. In the three-phase model, you can be looping between phase one, which is stabilization, and phase two, which is the trauma recovery, and you can keep bouncing back and forth between those like a pinball game and never actually make it to the resolution phase. Well, somewhere in the three phases, you should have enough selves control and we're advocating for a five-step model where somewhere in here, you would have enough selves control introspection, self-determination, you'd have enough internalized empowerment, et cetera, and be able to hold enough meetings to actually have good input on your recovery plan. The therapist should not say, well, you know, we're going to rush through stabilization spend a good bit of time in trauma stuff, and then we're going to integrate you. It's like, what? Wait, where? when was I included on this? <laughs> I wasn't included, so that means this is not happening. And then, you know, you end up with a lot of internal resistance and so on. No, this is a plan. You may not be capable of leading the whole process, so maybe that's one of the reasons you have a consultant. But the consultant is there to serve you, not to serve themselves. And if their motivation is not in your best interests, this is one of the places where you power check them and make sure that they have your interests in mind and what you want, not what they want or what they think is best for you. We start to move outside of the therapeutic relationship and the internal relationship into the outside world, where one of the first things you probably want to do in terms of empowerment is have healthier boundaries. And this is in an internal thing, too. I mean, healthier boundaries should happen throughout. But having healthier boundaries within, say, your family or healthier boundaries at work or healthier boundaries with a partner or with your friends. This is all very helpful. It helps contain your spoons. And if you want to put it that way, it helps you to keep your spoons and not let other people drain them on you because people steal spoons. 
And if you have healthy enough boundaries, you can stop that. You, you'd you stop a lot of the triggers, a lot of the vamping energy that happens in the world. A lot of the the subtle abuse, the more emotional manip- manipulation, the more verbal abuse stuff can be stopped just by having healthier boundaries. And we've said it before in the earlier session, but I'm going to say it again in this one case people haven't heard it yet. If you find yourself exerting healthier boundaries and then you're getting pushback from the person that you're creating or enforcing boundaries with, and they're pushing back and they're being rude, dismissive, if they're trying to pull more power games on you, that's a danger sign that they may be an abuser in your life. You may not have noticed and it's easy to miss some kinds of abuse. If you start bringing more empowerment into your relationship with them and they have a problem with it, if you have more power and control over your life and they are upset, that's not a great sign. If they're insecure, it's also a different kind of not great sign. It may be a codependent relationship where they're too emotionally reliant on you. They are not able to be empowered and have their own boundaries. So they've relied on this lack of boundaries in order to feed their insecurity, you know, feed their security level. And that's not healthy and that's not It's not a great long-term plan with a person to have that kind of a relationship, but that's not the same thing as being an abuser. It's an abusive relationship without somebody being an abuser, if that makes sense. It's, um, the relationship's not healthy, but the people aren't doing it deliberately. Whereas if somebody's seeing that they're losing control and power over you and they're panicking over it, that may be a sign that there's something more going on. And if it, might get violent, please seek help. You don't need to get physically hurt or have somebody financially drain you or anything else because you tried to exert your boundaries and create a healthier relationship with them. If you're having problems with that, you might need a crisis line. You might need domestic violence services. You might need adult protective services, which works with vulnerable populations to help adults stop abusing each other, basically. So if somebody has control of your finances, for example, and you say, hey, I'd like to start controlling my own finances, and they get all upset about it, then they may be financially abusing you and so on. So it's 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 a good idea to keep an eye on what's going on as you exert more boundaries and you take your own control back. Those healthy boundaries also help for the next step. It's, it's a spectrum. It's not a step. You don't have to do each of these things but it's kind of a spectrum of internalized empowerment through all of these different phases of external empowerment. And you don't have to do this. You don't have to come out. None of these are obligatory, but they are existing on a spectrum. You can play games of skipping around and play hopscotch on them. That's fine. So it's your life. (laughs) We're not prescribing this as a prescription. We're talking about it as a concept. The healthier boundaries, let's say it this other way, The healthier boundaries are extremely helpful when it comes to what we consider the next stage of advocacy on this spectrum. And that's the coming out phase. So when you have better boundaries, when you come out, people are a little less likely or able to hurt you. And I'm not saying it won't be sad or it won't be something that makes you upset or angry if they have a bad reaction to you coming out. But when you're feeling more secure and you make the statement differently than you would if you didn't have power and control. So now you have your internal empowerment and you have all these other places you've practiced empowerment. When you say, I'm plural, or you explain it as I have many people in my head or whatever it is, maybe you can say it with a period at the end of the statement so that it's not open for question. Maybe you can say it with that self-assurance that says, look, this isn't up for debate. This isn't something I'm thinking about. This is something that's just true. And you can either accept it or not. I am not going to be questioned on this. I have no doubts in my own mind and body. So I don't need questions from you on that, you know, on the validity of it. Holding your boundaries and having healthier boundaries and having all of this internal power can help with coming out. And in this case, usually it's coming out to people really close to you. It could be your best friend. It can be your partner, it can be your parents or your family, brothers and sisters, cousins. It can be a wider circle of friends 
like we came out in business groups. So when you come out, say it definitively. Don't leave it open to question. Don't make it sound like it's something you're ashamed of. Try not to be afraid of their reaction. Because when people smell fear, they get anxious. It's just a normal reaction. There's a gut instinct that when somebody is afraid, other people around them will get anxious and afraid too. It's, it goes back to humans living in clans and you just don't want to go there. So say it with as much confidence as possible so that you get less rejection, less fear, less questioning, and so on from the others around you. And it's fine to answer questions that are like normal. Oh, wow, you know, when did you figure this out? And things like that. But those questions that are meant to poke holes in your idea are not a good thing. Now we're moving from the interpersonal relationships between you and the others in your life to a greater cause. This is where we start getting into more plural activism and more advocacy on a systems level. The next thing is increasing people's awareness. Increasing awareness of plurality to help educate people because this step helps to alleviate some of the myths and the misconceptions. So we have plural awareness. Plural as the big umbrella. We think that that next step is easier once you have a good base of friends and family, and whether that's intentional family, blood family, or adoptive family. But once you have a support system, if you will, if you have a localized circle of people who are looking out for you and who know, it is easier to then start spreading out to the community and to talk louder, to have that voice, but to have that voice reach more people. So there's awareness. Then there's plural pride. Plural pride is saying that we're a movement and that we're a community. So not just awareness that we exist, but now also We exist and we want our own space in the world. We're going back to self-determination on a sociological scale. So just to review, self-determination is when a people are being oppressed. They lack choices to act without external compulsion as a group where there is some external entity that is defining them and taking away their self-determination as a group. So this is a measure actually used to define injustice in a population. So where I used it before to talk about internal stuff, I'm going to use it now on the entire society scale. The pride movement is to counter the self-determination issues, the injustice being done. The external culture, so in this case, singular society, is the counterpoint to plural society, plural community. They oppress us, and so thus there is injustice being done. So we are being denied many different things that we need to have in order to be self-determined as a group, as a community, as a culture in and of ourselves. So we have our own traditions and culture. A little hard to trace that back because we were oppressed so successfully for so long that they didn't even allow us to congregate. Because we were forced into suppressing our plurality and hiding in plain sight for so long, we weren't able to meet with each other very much, or only in very small groups. So we never had a big umbrella and a big flag to gather underneath, even if we're 1-3% to of the population or more, if you take into account all the other kinds of plurality. We have broken traditions and broken culture because the external society has continually stripped us of them. We have a history that goes back thousands of years showing the impression of people who hear voices, people who have many people in their head, people who dissociate and may or may not be possessed, people who would talk about other people in their head and get institutionalized, get lobotomized. We have an enormous wealth of the injustices done to us, historically speaking, without having anybody holding together the heritage, the traditions, and the culture. This last maybe 30 years marks a change 
where in some areas people did have support groups. So they actually had some gathering of people outside of therapy to discuss plural issues. And it's slowly, and also in 30 years ago, there was still MUDs and MUCs and IRC and and so on, like before the visual internet. So there have been online groups of people who are plural meeting for the last 30, maybe more, 30 to 40 years. So there were online groups back in the text days, text only days, command line days. <laughs> and then there's now the visual internet and all of the different groups that we have on the internet, as well as physical gatherings, physical people going to places to meet with other plurals to talk about various issues, whether it's just normal mundane stuff as a plural, or it's actually talking about the injustices being done and maybe some plans about what to do about it. We have our own language. Some of it is handed to us by therapy, but we've also worked up our own language. But we have our own beliefs about things, about what is right and wrong within our community and so on. In fact, some of it goes against some of the stigma that is brought to us from external community that we'll try and use our diagnosis to get away with stuff. That's ridiculous. It's, you know, bad people are bad people and good people are good people. And we don't condone bad people. We don't condone people going off and trying to get away with things and then claiming that somebody else did it. We don't do that as a culture within our groups, within the communities that we assemble in. This is not what we just, we talk about. We talk about group responsibility. We talk about how to increase people's ability to control the behavior of those who act out so that we don't hurt people. So having a community actually helps us to enforce those cultural ideas within our group. When we have co conversations, we get this sense of identity and kinship, and we can identify where we're different than other people outside of our groups. We also want to congregate more. So we have the will to constitute a people, quote unquote, that's what they, they say. We have the desire to get together in groups and to meet and to discuss these things and to work towards common goals and so on. And we, of course, have common suffering underneath the oppression that is coming down to us from governments, from the industry, the psychology industry, the psychiatric industry, the medical industry, and from the pharmaceutical industry. We have a lot of pressure and a lot of stigmatization. So that's why we have pride. We have pride to say we exist as a people. We exist as a group. We have our own valid reasons to congregate. We have our own valid needs for safe spaces to meet and to discuss these things. And we have reasons to fight back against those who oppress us and those who have served us injustice. So that is why we have pride. It is not, I am proud of being traumatized. It is, I am proud to be a multiple and I don't think it's right to oppress us. I am proud of being a plural. I like the people in my head. I'm okay with living with these people. Or I'm okay with living with these people on my way to unification. We are working on internal community so we can come up with the decision of whether or not to go through with unification. That's okay too. Why not be proud of it on the way? Because we're still being oppressed on the way. And the way the current system is worked out, we have six to 12 years just figuring out our diagnosis, if we have one or we want one. And then we have another 10 years of working on either healthy multiplicity or unification as the end goal. But along the way, we don't even know the end goal, right? We go through at least two, if not more stages of, of recovery. If I have my way, it's five total. But you know, you work on all but the last phase, basically not really knowing how it's going to end. And if that's 10 years, that's 20 years of your life to live without a community as a plural. Wouldn't it be better to have the strength of an actual coordinated, fully cultured, rich community to support you during those 20 years while you're figuring out who you are and maybe misdiagnosed all the way through whatever it is that you decide to do about it in the end? So that brings us to some of the problems with being oppressed nothing about us without us. We can't have 
the industry continually handing us decrees, if you will, on how to properly treat us and what they choose to research, etc., can't be in their hands without our input. We have a great deal of wisdom in the community about what ails us, about what our suffering is, about what our problems are, about how we're oppressed in society and what needs to change. We have a lot of ideas on all of this, but the researchers are deaf. They're not hearing us. They're not giving us a voice. They're not letting us in the room. Nothing about us without us means they shouldn't even be thinking about a research study or planning a study without plurals in the room. We can tell them they're barking up the wrong tree and save them time and money. We can tweak their methods so that they're more humane. Or we can help them with, let's say, survey questions and things to help them clarify whether or not people in our community will understand them. We could help them find more subjects so that their research has more than an N of 40. There's many ways that we can help get better data that we and therapists can use to help us achieve our goals in life and plan out our recovery. And now we're back to radical inclusion that I spoke about earlier. So we come from the Otherkin community, which started out mainly from the Elvenkind Digest list. So it was a lot of elves in the Otherkin community at first. So we started out mostly with a lot of elves from the Elvenkind Digest list, and then people started coming to us. They'd read the description on one list or Yahoo groups of the community. They were probably looking up things like non-human or elf or whatever. They'd looked up words and they found us. There's the other kin community, and then there's the other kin host community, which is those who are many, who are plural. So the plurals, especially, that was probably where most of this came from, maybe, was they'd have an elf in their head, they'd look it up, they'd find our lists, non-humans, elves, dryads, dwarves, dragons, and they'd find us, and they'd come in, and they'd be saying things that maybe we weren't thinking of. I'm going to pick one that is less likely to trigger people here things we thought were really weird. Let's say an alien, a gray, kind of out of uh, X-Files or something. Somebody would come in and be like, I have an alien, and be like, hmm, we've never met an alien before, huh? All right, fine, come on in. Next, it might be a vampire. Be like, hmm, never met a vampire before. I don't know, they don't got such a great rep, but what are we going to do about this? I don't know, let them in. So we started being very radically inclusive, and it started opening all of our minds to different experiences. Um, So we had plural systems in the other kin groups that had all different kinds of creatures, trolls, dragons, creatures based on religious text stuff, under a whole bunch of different names, and some of them gave us pause because... You know, we didn't like humans. And then a human came and was like, hey, I like you guys. I want to hang out and started coming to our gatherings and was very respectful, very, very nice human. Started coming to the physical gatherings. It's like, oh, okay. So we kept broadening the umbrella, if you will. We kept being more inclusive, more inclusive, more inclusive. We didn't kick anybody out based on their beliefs. They could think all kinds of weird things. We had gateway systems who would come be talking about, well, you know, our front is just this portal on a planet and people from the galaxy come to this planet kind of like a vacation spot. And it's one of the um, the amusement type of things on this planet. So sometimes we do have some that keep coming back. They have a season pass kind of thing and they keep coming back regularly. But sometimes somebody will just show up from from nowhere and they'll be there for a while and they'll be in the front portal and they'll be dealing with Earth for a while and then they just go and they never come back thousands and thousands and thousands of people in that what we would call on this end a polyfragmented system but that was their belief their belief from inside of their system was that they were a gateway system and there was this weird portal that went to earth and they control this body that's their system we just accepted it it's like okay that's your belief and we got more and more inclusive None of that stopped us from being an other kin plural group, mind you. None of that stopped us from anything, really. It didn't water us down. It didn't stigmatize us more because, at least we didn't think so, because we were accepting and open. It didn't hurt us that we could tell 
at all. Some people might have thought it was ridiculous, but that was okay. That was their belief. Their belief that we were being ridiculous is fine. As long as it didn't become something rude and trolling and things like that, it was fine. We basically, as a system... Whether or not other systems, whether or not other plurals agree with us, we don't care who agrees with us or not. We want radical inclusion. We want the Tulpamancers. We want the Brony Tulpamancers to be part of our community. We want medians. We want endogenic. We want traumagenic. We want queogenic. Queo, whatever it is. I can't say it. I can type it, but I can't say it. We want all of the people who want to be under the umbrella to be under the umbrella. And the people who don't want to be under the umbrella are under no obligation to be under the umbrella. Our group includes people who are DID, OSDD, QUEO, ENDO, trauma, TULPA, uh, voice hearers, schizophrenic, and I'm sure we're leaving some things out. Anyone who experiences many. And that can be highly aspected singletons. I have these masks and roles that I put on. I'm always the only one person behind it, but it's kind of like what you guys talk about, just a little less. It's like, okay, come on in, talk about it, share, because who knows if we're going to learn something. And we have, we're blending. Star is a aspected person within our system. We consider that to be part of, um, she's kind of a gatekeeper, but it's really one person with many different past lives, and she can show up as any of her past lives. So she's a she as the gatekeeper of that subsystem, but can show up as any of the gendered and non-gendered and third gendered. There's one species that has three genders. So she's a catalyst in that lifetime, or that's where we get into like pronoun issues. It's, it's a catalyst. When Star shows up as six arms, it's a catalyst. So we consider the radical inclusion, once we have people getting more aware, once we have pride, we have a voice on the research and planning teams, and now we have this radical inclusion, we end up being a much larger group. We have more voice. We have more power as a voting body, as a petition writing, pressuring different policymakers, and so on. We have more power more self-determination, if you will, as a larger group. So we have more history. We just have more of everything. We have more history. We have more ideas. We have more language. We have more identity, more kinship, all around being many. Which brings us to our last plural activism side of the spectrum. The last thing is policy changes. For example, one of the things we would really like to see is a policy change at the ISSTD and other similar organizations around the world to become a peer-run nonprofit, which means their unpaid board of directors would work its way as people come off the board and more people come onto the board. They'd work their way towards being 51% or more people they represent. So, yes, they could still all be licensed professionals. The whole board could be licensed professionals, but have people who are both licensed professionals and plural on the board so that we feel, we people on the ground with boots on the ground, we marchers and banner wavers and chanters and petition signers, so that we feel represented by the people who formerly oppressed us, hopefully instituting those seats on the board would start changing the direction of the organization from one who oppresses us to one that serves us and has our best interests in heart rather than their own personal gain as our therapists. If they want to say they represent us and that they're protecting us, the best way to represent us and protect us is for for us to be on the board and for us to be in the policy teams and for us to be in the the rewriting of the treatment guidelines and and so on and so forth, to be radically included also at the policy level. And this could also go for institutions. The 51% should be the people that they serve. 51% is not 51% of your board should be plural. So, for example, the ISSTD also works with people with PTSD, OSDD, DID, 
and possibly some of the other in-betweens, DPDR, the BPD people may start falling underneath this heading uh, with structural dissociation and so on. So that whole spectrum of people should be represented on the board with 51%, not just plurals, but it still is a plural concern. And definitely a lot of oppression comes out of the ISSTD, a lot of stigma that they're continuing to reinforce in the world. Even if they write a letter to Shyamalan saying, hey, this movie hurts plurals, doesn't mean they have our best interests at heart. Just make sure that we recognize who is potentially our oppressors, who is who is not limiting our stigma and who is continuing our stigma. If you read through the ISSTD guidelines, it's it's littered with bias and stigma the treatment guidelines. It needs to come out. You can't say you're on our side and then continue to promote the stigma and the biases against us in the industry. So at this point, we want to leave you with a challenge of instituting an attitude adjustment within your group from the inside out. And if you want to, you could start anywhere on this spectrum and do from the outside in as well. You could go the other way around and start with policy change and I think it's easier to go from the inside out, but that's us. You can start anywhere on this. You want to work on awareness first, or you want to work on coming out before you work on boundaries. You can do that. We have our reasons for recommending the order that we do, but you can certainly exercise your own freedom and your own control and your own self-determination in self-determination in how to implement these ideas. But do not settle for being disempowered at any level, because that's too much like being a vulnerable child again. And come together inside, in spite of your differences, to make massive and radical changes to access and inclusion in your own internal world. You have all the power you need to do that. And come together outside, in spite of all of our differences, to make massive and radical changes to access and inclusion in our external world. We want to leave you with a reading of the Plural Manifesto that's on kinhost.org. Plural Manifesto. You don't get to define us anymore by the Chris's. You look at yourselves and see only one way to be. It can't be any other way, you say. But we are here, living proof that you're wrong. For decades, you and your colleagues have told us that we're impossible, that we need to capitulate to the only way you can see to be, a singlet, which is funny because you haven't scientifically defined or observed consciousness or what it really means to be a person, but continually insist that we're only one of these things you can't run a lab test for or find under a microscope. You experience your consciousness in one limited way and then apply those same limits to us. We've had enough. You write books for us. You create therapies for us. You write guidelines for us. You create developmental theories for us. But what you never did was really listen to us. You didn't really ask us. You didn't really wait for us to tell you whether you were right or wrong. Thank you. Sometimes it's been helpful. Sometimes. But you may stop now. We don't want your patronizing and holier-than-thou, no scientific basis perspectives and developmental theories applied to our experiences any longer. You don't need to humor us. We will humor ourselves. If you wish to treat us, then treat us as equals, not subjects, in the experiments you perform on us. If you wish to work with us, then you can no longer dictate that we become more like you in order to be whole or healthy. We're already whole, and many of us are healthy. Those who need help need the right type of help. Some may want to see things your way, given this is a world full of singlets, and they may want to fit in. That's their prerogative. We want to change the world into one where plurals fit in as well, where it's not a case of my way or the highway, but a chance for a meeting of the many-minded to decide on new directions of thought for humanity. How better to understand the external discourse than to look inside at our myriad voices and multiple perspectives and shine a light on the world on how to work together, to work as one, to give humanity one solid direction and one unified voice in spite of, and in harmony with, the vastly differing voices, echoed from within a mind of hundreds or thousands. 
You waste the time of future potential leaders in trying to make us more like you. You stifle the unique voices of an author, a playwright, a director. You steal the perspectives from a cop who can process many scenarios at once. The doctor who can run through options and outcomes and come up with ideas that are sound and have already been thought through by several qualified physicians, all residing in one beautiful, multifaceted brain. Are you afraid that we'll be better at your job than you are? That will only be true if you continue to deny that we exist and that we are different, and we're pretty freaking normal overall, except until now, we've needed to be given permission to allow our various voices to express themselves. We will be silent no longer. We will take it from here unless you work with us. We will teach ourselves to work together and think and brainstorm as a whole, to help each other inside and out with our unique perspectives and talents, and act as if, perhaps, there's much more to a person than just one brain and one set of hands and eyes. Sit down and listen to us, or you'll be left behind. Old men sit in rooms and ponder our future, write books that will tell us we're just parts, and that our only healthy and inevitable outcome is to merge into one person. Newsflash, you don't get to define us anymore. Your choice. Ignore us, and we'll surprise you. Join us, and we'll amaze you. We really look forward to working with all of you in terms of plural activism and plural advocacy. This has been the Chris's. This is Buck. This is very exciting. I'm so glad to get this information out there. And I really look forward to working with everyone to get this out there into the world. Thank you so much. Please take good care of yourselves. And thank you for your time. <laughs>